Episode 12 of Eternal MMA Uncensored. Yeah, it took 12 episodes, but it's called the podcast by its appropriate name. It's, uh, I like Emma Uncensored um, separately, but I also like the podcast being called that. It just it feels cooler. Someone said to me the other day at Ignition Muay Thai, not even an MMA event, they said, I listened to your uh, Emma Uncensored podcast. Did you punch me in the face? No, I said thank you. And it means that I'm influential. In the uh, in the regional scene, you're you're a, a bastion of, uh, of WA combat sports, mate. Uh, Shining light. Yes. Uh, guys, obviously, uh, big event last week. Last week, two weeks ago. The week before last. Yeah, week, week before that. Um, I had a lot of people ask me how do we get guests on type thing. So if you guys are listening or you know anyone that you might want to know more about. Uh, send us a message, either find me or Ben on Facebook, Ben Vickers or Mitchell Tinley. Probably find me because you're worried about matching fights. Um, and uh, we'll get them on. We'll have a chat to them. doesn't matter who they are. It can be a referee in the commission. Can commissions talk to us? I don't see why not. Well, they want to. That's another Or any fighter. I don't care if you're 0-1, and 0-0, and thinking about fighting. You've been training for two weeks. I don't care. If you want to be on, uh, we'll have a chat to you. It beats fucking looking at Ben the whole time. Hey, I've got hair now. I'm very respectable looking. Yeah, what's going on? Why are you for this audio uh, podcast? What, what's with the hair? You I, I figured that I'm a long time bald. You know what I mean? If I, if I, if I have a skinhead or a shaved head for the rest of my life, which is going to be, I'm what, 37, so at least another 70 years, I'm going to get bored of it, you know? I'm going to live to 110. <laughs> yeah, so you can't have uh, you bald. Cam bold, Dana White bold, Joe Rogan bold. Look like a fucking egg packet. Mm. <laughs> just, just the only guy with them. Hard boiled eggs everywhere. Exactly. But that's what happens when you coach fighters, you lose your hair. Same Fuck with you know. any coach out there. Basketball coaches, they're all bald. All short, bald and fat. That's, that <laughs> makes you a great coach. If you have hair, you, you're nearly there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't think I can ever subscribe to the fat part. It's huh? just not in me. I love training too much. I don't think I'll ever be fat. Thought you already did. <laughs> Eternal 29. What was that? <laughs> I didn't even get that. <laughs> um, hey, a... I saw a picture of you on Instagram bombing at a comedy. Wait, I didn't bomb. I didn't bomb. Now, what happened is the mic cut out halfway through and like the batteries died and I'm a professional. So I threw the microphone, continued my joke. No microphone. How'd it go down? Like a fucking lead balloon or what? Well, I've got the excuse that they couldn't hear me because of the microphone. That's... Because you can lose your tone there, get to shout, then you might lose some of your subtle inferences. It felt like slam poetry. But that's also why I don't like doing the weigh-ins uh, with no microphone, because it feels weird. I'm always like, all right, next on the dub yeah, stage. Shout. Yeah, and it just feels, and I already shout on the microphone, so it's hard enough. Um, that's a quick question. What do you think about the, not just your weigh-ins, but weigh-ins in general? Like the, Let's the make today's episode all about you asking questions. Okay. That'll be interesting. I think you can interview me. I feel sarcasm. No, okay, no, I feel, no, I feel no, a like, lot of... Let's be honest, we didn't really have a plan. And you've asked, you, you like asking questions. Yeah, it's my natural... I'm down to answer some questions today. Well, it's because you normally say outlandish, crazy shit, and if I ask you enough questions, you're going to say something crazy, and it's going to create drama, and therefore, I feed off drama. I'm like anybody's drama girlfriend. Queen. Yeah, anybody's girlfriend. I'm just ready to create drama. Um, so, first Wait. question. Yeah. This is a bit like this. This is just yeah. interviews, like it's Oprah. Like, fuck <laughs> Parkinson. So with with Wayans, do you like that there's like a performance of it, like it's like it's on show? Or would you rather it in a back room, just get it over and done? No, with? I definitely think that the fighters have earned that, you know, earned that time in the spotlight to have decent pictures taken of them. It's good for us as a promotion that we can use that those pictures on on posters and stuff like that. And it's good for the fighters to get their first sort of head to head with their opponent and start. You know, not they might learn a little bit from that. Do you like? Do you think that's part of the game? Like the, I do, yeah. Well, you look at UFC weigh-ins, look at Mayweather, Pacquiao. They're selling now mm. twenty thousand seat stadium just for the weigh-ins. You know, and the atmosphere and all that. It sort of builds the excitement up. So yeah, I definitely think that it should be a thing. So for like a tournament, would you rather like a bigger weigh-in or a, like 
are you still at the game or places like that? Do you like that sort of on stage way in? Or at this level, do you want to keep it a little uh, bit? Yeah, I mean, eventually I'd like it to be an event in itself. So you get people there, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think that's definitely the future is. You know, in, in Southport Sharks, we do it in the sports bar there. People sit around. Some people will eat food, you know, have a beer, watch the weigh-ins. It's a bit, there's a bit more space. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, we'll, we'll look at the way we package the weigh-ins next time but yeah it should be an event it should be a little event in, in an event but it's important to get the fighters onto the scales as quickly as possible I really yeah I feel like we should maybe weigh them first that's and what then we did. do the yeah. well, that's what we did I think so the scales will open you can weigh in whenever you're ready after the scales are open at 6 o'clock um, and then uh, after that we'll do the theatrical weigh in and now I've never I've never had to weigh in I think I did once weighed in for like a jits comp, but that's like you stand on the scale and you're like, oh, you're not, you're in this other division now, and then you just go fight in that division. But is, do you find that the fighters are annoyed with weigh-ins or are they like, do you feel like oh, as soon as they hide, no your one own, wants to cut weight and no one wants to stand around waiting around when they want to drink water and eat food. So, yes, I'm sure fighters are annoyed, but I'm sure it's the worst part of the whole experience is cutting that weight and then. Being there undercooked and, and not not feeling the best, um, waiting around for someone to tell you, you know, you can drink now, blah, 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 um, and waiting for your opponent to turn up. So we've tried to eradicate that by opening the scales, and if your opponent's not here, we, we weigh you in anyway. And what's the go like with what's the biggest you've had a fighter cut weight? Like, how much weight? It's hard, uh, me personally, as a coach, one of my guys are super weight cutters. Jack, Jack Della cuts a lot of weight. But he's got it down to a science, and as you would expect, he doesn't um, doesn't grumble about it. I think Mitch Martin cuts a, a fair amount of weight these days. Never used to. He looks about my size when I stand next to him. He's yeah, he's, he's big boy, big man and weight. And I'm about 73, 74, and he weighs in at is that sixty three, sixty one, sixty. Woo! But Ryan is the hardest one. Like he, he'll admit it. That's why he fights at feather. I mean, really, he should be a batman. He hates cutting weight, so. He's much happier cutting less weight and just fighting that hard. So can it be uh, sort of made easier by like dieting leading up to it, or is it is it, at the end of the day is that you have to cut those couple of kilos and that's going to kill regardless? Um, it all depends. Like your water load and stuff like that keeps sodium out of your diet, so you're not retaining any water. Um, there's lots of little things, and people have different ways. Some people, some people sauna, some people bath. Um, there, there's so many different ways of, of getting to the weight. Yeah, if you, the more you diet down, the less you're going to have to cut in water, but then the less size you're going to put back on after the weight. So it's still a bit archaic for me. I mean, why why everyone doesn't just fight at the weight they walk around that baffles me. I think it's similar, to, and it's, it's got a, quite a link to uh, PEDs and things like, if the other guy's doing it, yeah, exactly. You're you feel gonna, you have to do it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get rid of it until it's a rule that you're not allowed to do it. And there's a way of testing people's hydration levels, which some promotions do. The commission does a secondary way. It's on just the... for, for um, data, not for anything else. So there's no like limit if you've cut like ten percent. Like I said, Brandon Rapati walked back into the cage at ninety six kilos after weighing in at eighty four. That is massive. That's giant. Mean, that's so much weight. And um, obviously, Josh's uh, Josh look like he doesn't cut weight. Is he he cut he diets most of his weight off. He's lucky he's tall, and he's strong, so he doesn't need to be massive. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. But Josh is a welterweight, and you know, scary thing for the welterweights, all the welterweights. That's the thing. Is it is he going to stay at middleweight or what's the at deal? this level? Yeah, he's going to win. You know, he's got that title that he's chasing at middleweight. Jack's obviously the title holder at Welter. He's not going to fight his brother. Um, so while they're both operating in Australia, um, Josh will stay at 84 and, and Jack will stay at 77. But when Josh gets to the big stage, then we're gonna, he'll be a welterweight. And uh, have, you, have you dealt with any sort of light heavyweights, heavyweights in, in, the, in the weight cuts? Have you had, have you had to deal well, with heavy, Most heavyweights aren't cutting weight. I mean, Ricky, the, the limit's 120 kilos. So um, Ricky was under that, and he's a big, big lad. He weighed in at one seventeen. Yeah. So, so um, 
light heavyweights or cut. Yeah, but I haven't had any myself. Mm. But um, yeah, heavyweights don't generally cut. You've got your Mark Hunts and Brock Lesnar's mm. of this world. I mean, you fought in the uh, Stone Age. So how was weight cutting back then? I didn't cut anyway. Was it just like you fought whoever rocked up? I fought 84 kilos. I fought just whoever was about. Like I fought in many different weight classes. And I walked around about 65 kilos, so I always took featherweight fights. What are you now? 70. 70? Jeez. God, slim, slim 70. My guess is 64. See? Mm. You guess it's 64. Mm. Oh, well, I've got a big piece. It's the bit of the... I was thinking the extra weight was the gi that you wear. And then... Constantly when I weigh myself. Yes, yes. And then that goes into the grappling. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the ADCC, which... Uh, I didn't watch. The grappling Olympics, as we like to call it. Didn't watch it. But you did hear the standouts. I heard Gordon Ryan only. Yeah, and I want to talk to you about just about that in general and your knowledge of, of other fighters. Now he's he's twenty two and an absolute stud. Like his brother, younger brother, sixteen, uh, is amazing as well. But Gordon Ryan has only been training for six years. That's not real. I mean, it's half. I've been training double that, yeah. maybe more than double that. Oh, I've been training like like I was aware of it longer than that. So that's insane that. Six years, because everyone's thought is always when you get those like young prodigies, like like a like a guy like a Will Diaz in Perth, who's a, who's a great black. Like you, you always go, oh yeah, but they started when they were eight or or, or seven, or of course they're going to be good at that young age. But to get someone that's only been doing it for like six years, I mean, BJ all, Penn won the world championships after four years of play. We got his black belt after four years. Something ridiculous. Don't grappling heads don't shout at me. <laughs> do you reckon that is like? Genetics in a way, or is it training? Not genetics. Or is it like, well, well, genetics will play a part in it, but it's just some people just get it. Is that the thing? So it's not necessarily like. I think it took me a year to understand why the fuck I was moving any of the movements that I was doing. Oh, my, I couldn't even start. get the. You know, when you're in guard and you kind of use your legs are up and you're just kind of ready to start playing? Well, I couldn't do that for like a year. I was just flat on my back and then my, my feet were like, nah, I don't know what to do. I just rolled it. It is like some people, but then I see people in the gym. After six months, you know, teaching here, and it's like, wow, you've only been doing this for six months. Like, some people just get it, their body understands the movements, and, and it comes quite naturally to them. Others will, will struggle for all time. Some people will, will always be awkward on the mats. And that's why I think, especially when, when it's guys that are just training MMA, or they're not coming from any other background, they tend to find their favourite thing they like doing, whether it's striking or wrestling or jiu-jitsu. Do you reckon that is because they just, you know, they're naturally good at that, so they kind of phase into that? Most or... of the time you enjoy doing the one that you're best at, right? So if you're a good stand-up guy, you're going to not enjoy as much your time on the um, on the mats. But um, I think you grow to, to love it all, you know, mm. eventually. When, you, when you're really immersed in it, you know, you enjoy it. And then I've gone full circle. Like I used to love the stand up way more than I used to love the grappling. And and now I hardly do any stand up. Is that because you've like, been punching the head so much? I don't like getting hit in the head anymore. But, <laughs> but, but then I do once I start. Like once I start sparring, I love the war. It's bloody weird, isn't it? Like it's even that dork like myself. Like once I get hit that first time, you almost like enjoy it. It's I love the walk. Like I, I'd love to throw all technique out the window and just, just have a walk. But then I don't feel good afterwards. Like, like as in like body health or just just my head. It's like, it, like so now, if, if if I'm not sparring, I'm not I'm not missing it. Once I start, like sometimes I get talked into it or I just fancy it. I start doing. It, I absolutely love it. You know, I've still got twelve rounds in the tank. Mm. Like, been doing it for that long that I can still like jump. It wouldn't be the most effective 12 rounds you've ever seen, but I'll get through 12, 12, 3. But yeah, I come out of there and I've got that euphoria when I finish and then and then it all sinks in and my head hurts and I get a bit absent-minded and stuff like that. Because I've got even some guys I train with that are nowhere near as good as the other guys I train with, but for some reason we just click and it's like we go 100%. We just, we just click. We know how to just nearly kill each other and then there's other guys that 
they're of all, we're all of a similar level, but then there's other guys that we just we just don't click. We're, all, we're almost uh, our stand up is forty percent. We don't go that full hundred. Or you gotta have trust in someone to have a war. I think like the guys I have wars with are often like the guys I get on with the best, or you know the guy guys that I've known longer. Or um, there's a particular guy who personal train with, and he's an ex army guy. I know the style. I know what he's gonna bring. I know how tough he is, and, and it ends up. We start saying, oh, we'll just go light. And before you know it, it's escalating. Like you get hit with a good shot, the next one comes in. And before you know it, people have come in spectating that sparring session and gone, you do fucking hate that. <laughs> That's what uh, I... There's this one guy I used to train with who only started maybe a year ago, two years ago. And he's about 57 kilos and about five foot three. But he used to play rugby. And there's just some, there's something... I think... I know we don't have wrestling. It's not a big deal in Australia yet. But when you take rugby guys and they come over to MMA, for some reason they just they get they, the grappling and they get the converts really well. Like now he can't shoot a double leg, but he can pick you up and slam you on your head. Yeah. And there's something about it. And his level is is uh, like I'm not even sound like an idiot saying that mine is higher. He just for some reason has just he knows how to grit it out and fight, and he wants to take my head off at the same well, time. Rugby players aren't scared of contact. And he will have been playing, especially in this country, with the Kiwis and the Islanders, with big guys, all, all, and he's not scared. So he's just, he, and he's not, and he's used to that contact. So that's what I find. It's, it's just easy to mix it up because there's no fear of the consequences. Yeah, I've no, and I've noticed a lot of those. You know, you get a lot of those NRL rugby league players that go to boxing and go to things like that, and they they cop a lot of shit because you know they generally get some some pretty easy fights the way they the way they're teed up. But if there's one sport in Australia that I think can cross over a little bit, I think it might be rugby league. AFL is still not; it just doesn't have that. Where rugby league's got that like grit, that real uh, like you, any rugby, you league or union, it's, uh, you know. And think union, you're lying at the bottom of a big pile of fucking people, so you're used to that being squashed, being stuck underneath people. Whereas league is more of a hit up and then stand back up again. So that's the impact kind of side of it, and then union. You get the impact, but then you get laying on top of. There could be six guys, and you're at the bottom of this fucking pile of mm. fat people. And uh, <laughs> you just get used to like being comfortable in those little spaces and finding where your breath is, and you know if yeah. you get off you in a second. But that's why I think like uh, I think basketball was good. It's not obviously no contact, but it's a lot of footwork and it's a lot of you learn moves and you practice certain moves, and I think that's helped me the most with like striking and things like that. Now, that time when you grit and just throw down, it's like that's there or it's not or you, you fight yeah. through it. But when you're learning like the TJ Dillashaw style of striking and the, the ins and outs and you watch Dominic Cruz and all how they move, it's very similar in, in basketball footwork. But obviously just like any other sport, like you've got to be good at rugby. You can't just play rugby. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to actually be good at that sport for it to then um, transition. But... Is it was there anyone in like uh, UK sport like rugby and that that transitioned in, into fighting? Like we've got in Australia with your Quade Coopers and boxing and things um, like that. There's been a few like soccer players that that transitioned across. Um, oh, I'm just trying to think of their names now. Where the old thing in, in, in the news at the moment? Rio Ferdinand, who's a Man United uh, defender and a West Ham defender, he's going to come and have a professional boxing fight. He's 38. Um, like as part of like a... So I don't know how they're going to do it. Like Andrew Flintoff did it back in the day as a cricketer. Um, for those of you that don't know, fast bowler. Um, he had a pro boxing fight which he won. But obviously they get their opponents. Um, nice yeah. <laughs> picks for them. But it's still, still, they've still got to get in there with the journeyman and have a fight. So, um, but yeah, I can't think of any of the, the rugby boys that have done it. Um, there was Matt Stevens who uh, was a prop. He, he became a really decent jiu-jitsu and player. A prop is a... Big fat guy. <laughs> the front of the scrum. Uh, they're the... They're the, they're that, the, they're the two on the outside and then the hook is in the middle. So they're on the front row of the scrum. Big round guys. Like. So they... Um, and then you've got Adam Holyoke who's, who's over here now. He's had some boxing fights and he was a good, good cricketer. Took up boxing and had some MMA fights and stuff. Did pretty well. Do you think it's just like? Uh, do you think it's just in the 
DNA of people in, the, in, in competitive in, athletes. Like if you're a top level athlete in a relatively you know, I'm not talking about darts or anything like that. They're, they're not athletes. They're well, not well, people sport. sport. But yeah, if you're a good athlete, like and you've made it to international level or the Olympics or anything like that, you can probably transfer those skills. And then you've just got to find out if you've got the heart. I guess that's a lot of things, like, too. Like, whatever you're doing, if you're at the top of, like, your game, all the effort that it took to get there, very rarely do you just wake up and you're the best AFL player or you're the best... Oh, absolutely. Even the best businessman, like, they're fucking... You've got to work hard type thing. And if you can do that, if you can take all that effort and put it into something else... Yeah, so it's the work. More than likely, that's how that tees up. Like, even... Um, now, when I'm not around MMA and I'm not like hitting the bag, I'm not working, like I'm, it's really out of my mind. Like I think about it, but it's not like I'm not eating well because of MMA or, or sort of things like that. But when I'm driving to training, when I'm doing that 35 minute drive to training, I'm training to be a world champion. Like that's in, you in said my. That the other week. Yeah, it's funny that um, mindset. And I think a lot of people, well, I'm thinking that a lot of people have that mindset. But what makes you a champion is the consistency. So you have to think like that all the time. Yeah. 24 7. Where I think like that, one hour a week, <laughs> two hours a week, three hours well, a week. Yeah. My, my, I've got a brother who's a year and 10 months older than me. Um, and I mean, I don't think you mind me saying I'm probably naturally more talented at, at most sports than he is. However, he's achieved way more than me. Um, in the sports that we've done together because he is the guy, even in his professional life, that if he does something, he wants to be the best at it. Yeah. And he lives it, breathes it, sleeps it. Like when he was fighting, he had a, I think it was nine and two pro MMA record or um, MMA record anyway. And, you know, he beat Artem Lobov, he fought some, some good guys. Um, but, but I don't yeah, in Artem's pro debut, Pat. Yeah. Jeez. And that's why he's... Absolutely uh, destroyed, Pat, destroyed him. Well, that's why Artem's record's like, what, 13 and 13 or something? Yeah, and it's, <laughs> you know, it just goes to show how good Artem's done to, to be at the level that he's at, you know, headline the UFC card. But that, he goes into the, the stage of, like, we've talked about this before, about guys that uh, are killers in the gym, but it just doesn't go their way on fight night. Uh, he's just Artem gone off track here but Artem is just that his style is he's a bang he just mm. he, and you know he's going to come unstuck when you can take him down and cause him some but he's good on the ground he's a good grappler but you know his overwhelming want is to smash you in the face and knock you out yes. and that's how it plays out in, in all his fights you know he's not going to move around and pick you off he's going to swing big shots from all good angles and sometimes do you think as a coach you, I mean you were talking about your brother too and, and, and your relationship with it. Do you think you can see that in fighters now and see who's the guy that's good but doesn't want it and things like that? Have you? Yeah, oh, mate, it's so obvious. Like, if you, you've just got to look around the gym and who's always here, who's early for training, who's doing the extra, who's um, asking you questions. Here's the kicker with this, though. This is what I used to do in basketball sometimes, is I used to make sure you saw me. That's the diff. Like, there's some things where the guys are working there's like three levels of it. There's guys that aren't working, there's guys that are working, and then there's guys now, that want you to see I'm going to give you the them. difference now. Basketball may translate in a lot of ways to fighting and, and footwork. In basketball, you're not getting locked inside a cage with enough human that wants to take your head off. So the want and desire in everyone, if you're, if you're actually an active fighter, is you know that the end result is you get locked. It's not like, oh, you might have a bad game and your team might mm. lose. You're going to get smashed in the face. You're going to get tired. You're going to get put in a bad position. You're not going to be able to get out. So there's a lot of self-motivation in there, and you see that in the guys. And um, Yeah, you can tell the ones that are in it. I actually had a chat with the guys after a training session. After, not after the last show, but the show before. A few of them went on the missing for a little while. And I was like, you have a short window of opportunity for this. Yeah, you might have one fight, you know, have a week off, rest, have a, even two a uh, stretch, but most people don't want two weeks off. But, you know, I shouldn't have to be asking you to come into training. Yeah. You should be asking me. Um, the question shouldn't be, do you do you need me to train? It should be, um, when do you want me to train? You know? 
it's not, um, and that's you see that in the attitude of the guys that are going to go all the way, and it's different than the others. You shouldn't have to a, a top level fighter. You shouldn't be calling them up saying I'm going to train today. Mm. You should be saying you need to take a day off. You need to you've been doing too much. You know? And you seem like a very like hands on coach when it comes to that sort of stuff. That it's like you you generally know what your fighters are doing, and you kind of know. Hundred percent, yeah, and, and I'm. If they're not at training, when they're supposed to be at training, they'll get a text message or a call from me saying, where, where are you, where have you been? And sometimes they might have told me the night before that they weren't going to be in and I'll forget because there's so much going on in, in my head. But if if I don't see you, I'm going to ask you where, where you are. And, yeah. You know, I'm always going to hold you accountable because you've told me you want to be a fighter and you want to represent me. So then you need to show me. It's not That's not a given. That's an honour. That's what I think is a, a, a real killer... Uh, uh, for coaches is the fact that how many people do you reckon have come up to you and said I want to fight or I want to be a fighter and then you put them through just a tenth of what they have to do and you can see it already that that's not what they expected yeah I mean it's it's one thing watching it at a local level and you think oh yeah I could do that you don't see what these guys are doing behind closed doors and, and the mm. shit that they're going through and the sacrifices they're making but that's what I was telling you about, like, the, the one hour a week type thing. Like, when I'm doing that one hour a week or two, three, four hours a week, I'm like, oh, I could do this. You know what I mean? Like, but you got to do that every fucking day. And this last week, I've trained six times in four days. And I'm like, oh, I'm ready for a break. Like, you can't yeah. do that if you've got a six-week, eight-week Yeah, and camp. the other thing is, forget the training, okay? That's one aspect of it. Then you've got diet. Then you've got to do strength and conditioning in your own time. Like we don't cover, we don't have time to cover that in class. Then you've got your whatever personal life you got. You might have a girlfriend, you might have a kid, you might have a wife. You're putting all these people on the back burner because you know that when the door shuts behind you, they're not in there. And, and, and if you're a pro fighter, you're getting paid. This is your job. It's your job now, so man. it's not a case of you've got to look at it like that. It's like, do you always want to go to work? No, but. You're not going to get paid if, if you don't turn up, like, and you're going to get sacked. And it's the same with fighting. You're not going to be a fighter for long if, if you're not turning up. Well, you can. You always. Can, it's easy to go to training when you want to go to training. It's like yeah. the hard bit is is when you don't want it, and that's generally when the best shit happens. Like half the time, when I'm like, Ma, I don't want to do. I don't want to do this. And then you make yourself do it. Something awesome happens, and. It, but like you said, that eight weeks, six weeks, whatever it is leading up to a fight, that's the stuff that can really make or break. Because like we were just talking about, one week, anyone can do one week. And then it's the second week, the third week, the fourth week. Do you find it hard seeing your fighters get those eight weeks perfect? Or do they ever have like weeks where it's bad? No, we really? play it by ear. Like I can see by their performance if... They're coming in and they're getting beaten by people that wouldn't normally beat them or their times are bad or they're not finishing first in some of the cardio stuff we do before we start the class. Um, or I can just tell sometimes by the way that they're training that they're tired. And that's the time when I'll turn around and say, look, take a night off, rest, don't do anything tomorrow. Like, um, So there's definitely periods and, and obviously you've got to try and time it so that they're not peaking too soon. You don't want them to be peaking four weeks out. So you've got to, it's really, um, we've, we've got it down to a fine art here, like the way, way we do it. But I don't like the term training camp. Like we might have six weeks of hard training for a fight, but you should be in the gym consistently and then ramp it up. Not like, I know there's some fights and it doesn't happen here because I don't allow it, but they have a fight, they disappear, they come back 10 weeks before the next fight. They might have lost four or five weeks of um, development time because you're not developing that much as a fighter when you're in that hard six weeks. You're sparring, you're drilling, and you're consolidating what you already know. You're getting sharp and you're, and you're getting fit and you're getting um, fight ready. So we're looking forward to once Mitch and Jack are done um, in the next four weeks, we're looking forward to a big period before the next eternal where we can actually do some development. So yeah. we can start working on the mistakes we've been making Although we do cover that stuff and I try and sort of separate out the guys that are not fighting for a while and, and keep it, sometimes it gets hard and I just have to put everyone into the same same mix because there's only one of me to keep an eye on everyone. 
How do you like to go with techniques? Like, do you, do you take them through technique classes and then try and try and do it under stress? Like, under um, we do positional stuff and drilling. Um, I don't like I said with Brian last week. I try and um, theorize a little bit in the advanced classes. So we'll discuss position and, and the principles of what you should and shouldn't be doing in these positions and the options, and then we'll drill it more open. Whereas in the beginners class, it'll be like, right, this is how you do it. More yeah. grab the wrist, sit up. Boom. Whereas I don't want to be parrot fashion with these guys who, who have got a lot of experience. They've done a lot of um, figuring out their own style and the way they do things might be slightly different to the parrot fashion that I teach them because they've figured it out over time and their body types are different and their style is different. So yeah, we go through more like training training theories yeah. and, and um, tactics and stuff like that. And then a lot of um, stand-up like Dutch drills, so combinations for combinations, but at a fight pace and, and at a sparring intensity. So you know what's coming, but you're getting that cardio and you're getting used to seeing it coming at, at speed. And we try and use that kind of stuff for conditioning rather than actual, yeah. Yeah, actual conditioning. So it's fight specific conditioning and then wrestling drills and bad position drills and cage drills. But even little things like I did three weeks of just like grappling and then I hit the pads. And I was like, <gasps> oh, <it's so laughs> yeah, you've got to hit both aspects. It's so weird. You can be like, you can go out and run and be fit there. And then you can grapple, be fit there. And then you hit the pads and it's completely different. Absolutely yeah, different yeah. I was talking to, I went for a run with um, Josh and Jack's dad actually on the weekend. He's a, he's a mad runner. And uh, we did a 10K run. Now, in April, I did a 65.5 kilometer run. Seven and a half hours. What? Yeah, I don't. What's that for? Well, I'm not competitive anymore in fighting, so I wanted something that would challenge me mentally, which it fucking did. So I wanted to get out of my comfort zone, find out that I was still mentally strong, and could push through. Yeah. But I'd got no interest in, in my competitive um, juices in fighting and 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 stuff is not there anymore. I know what you mean. We, look, we've got this similar thing when we when we talk about stuff, where you can tell we're not chasing anything necessarily, but it's still there. And I reckon everyone's loved, got it. I was always told by coaches that I worked better when I was tired. I almost needed to get tired first. And I've always enjoyed. I've always been comfortable being uncomfortable, mm. and I didn't feel like I was getting myself there. So that's why I did this run. I was like, it was a bucket list thing. It was like an ultra marathon. Because um, marathons, is it fifty k? No, is marathons that? forty-two. Forty-two. Yeah. So this is like a marathon and then another half marathon. Jeez. So anyway, <laughs> April I could do that uh, and I finished that, I completed that race, I think 20 out of 50 completed it. I was the last to complete it. But, you know, they were all seasoned ultra marathon runners and I trained for eight weeks. <laughs> yeah, no, just, uh, just making it is... All my toenails fell off, like it was fucking ridiculous. Oh, I hated it, I didn't even enjoy it and it's actually put me off running, which I, and I love running. Well, you've done enough running for a whole year. Yeah, for That's... a lifetime. So. <laughs> but... It's, that goes to show how, how the body, like I ran 65.4, actually, 65.4 kilometers, 64.4 kilometers, 40 miles. Um, but now I'm struggling with 10Ks, like 6Ks, 10Ks, and that was only a few months ago. Jeez. Because I just stopped running. <laughs> I was like, fuck this running Does that mentality, like, are you, do you reckon that helps when you do the 6K, 10K, where you go, it's not 64? Well, no, it gets the other way with me. I'm like, fuck, you know, why are you doing? I can't even do this. <laughs> when before you could do this pace for fucking. 40 See, that's weird. That's interesting because I'm the opposite. I'm whatever something is big, and I'm, I'm big off like confidence in a sense. Like if you yelling at me the whole time, like Mitch, you're not doing this right. Mitch is horrible. Come on, man, you're better than this. Oh, Mitch, it kind of works the opposite now. Where if you're like Mitch, you look amazing. Normally, other people would maybe relax a bit, and then you kind of have to snap. Like yell at them to get them to snap in, but for some reason with confidence, I'm, I think I'm amazing. You look amazing, oh, yeah. and everything's tight. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> and I watched the tape. And I'm like, I didn't look. No, amazing. I go the way around. I don't like being complimented. Oh like, really? I just want to. That's why I don't do it. Well, thanks, mate. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> I just want to go hard. Mm. Like I've got that mentality. I love tough. I love feeling like shit. I love being in those difficult places. That's where I really thrive, um, and that's what I try and put into the boys. It's like, you know, I was always. When I was fighting, I was always the fittest. I was always fucking wanted, wanted to go another round. I was, even if I was fucked, that's when I started enjoying myself. Like it was, it's weird, but it still exists in me. Like I love being tired. I love, I love that shit. I like you, you probably don't have to go through the whole 
retired fighter thing as much, but you still, it's whatever made you fight, it's still there. So you've got to, I do think about it all the time. Like, should I, because I'm way more skilled now than I was when I was fighting. Yeah. Way more skilled now. I know so much more. Like, when I had an MMA career, I only really knew how to do stand up. I didn't really do jiu jitsu, I didn't really wrestle. Um, even though my sole MMA win was by triangle. <laughs> Fuck knows how that happened. I think I was listening to the other corner telling him how not to get triangles and <laughs> reversed it. But yeah, I, like I'm so much better equipped now to have an MMA fight than I ever was before and I have no, I have no desire to do it. But occasionally, like I'll be at a fight show and I'm thinking, Fuck, I could just do one more. Like, well, I did a wrestling comps last year. I did two wrestling comps. Yeah? Like one proper amateur, like yeah, like freestyle, wearing the silly fucking tights and all that kind of stuff, which was really cool. That was good to get those butterflies again. And I think the first one I had, um, some people were trying to steal money. Do you need to go talk to them? Oh, yeah, Yanni's in here. Apparently, he's got to be careful. <laughs> yeah. So, um, are you gonna do the jits comp coming up? No, no, you did. no never. Interest, no interest in jits comps. I've done a lot of jits comps in the past. But no, it's just the only thing that puts me off is uh, the price tag. That that's it. It's just it does just kill me. Have it. It's not to me. Yes, it's not something that gets my competitive juices flowing. It doesn't do like I never really got nervous for jits comps. To me, I was like, oh, it's just like spying what people are watching. And for for me, I don't know how other people go, but for me, the more people, the better I feel. I think that's just in my blood. Like the the you like to perform the performing aspect. This is that's another reason why I think I always think about having an. MMA fight one day and that's where I go that's the ultimate performing like in the gym is in the gym and you're working hard and you're training hard there's some guys that will fight where it's just him and him no one's watching that's me. to me oh. that interests me a little bit but not as much as testing it in front of a thousand people I think I just think personally this is me on way out there I think me against someone else the more people I think will give me I'll thrive better than the other guy. And I think that's you, just... Yeah, that's obviously you're an entertainer. You know, you are in entertainment and mm. that's what you like to do. I'd much rather have a dust up in the backyard and, and just be done with it. The old Rocky Apollo. No one in there. Yeah, just, just <laughs> fucking get it over and done with it. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how to... But yeah, I do I do still think about it and sometimes like I'll, I'll have a go and I'll spy and I'll feel good and I'll be like, and then I get how close? How percentage? How oh, close it's not do you that reckon? Close, but it's not that close. Enough? Not enough. No, nowhere near. Just I couldn't be bothered to to deal with being hungry, being miserable, being stressed, and I've got a young. How much say you weigh? Seventy. You want to fight me? I was just no. I was saying like I if, can see what you were gunning for. If really. I no, but like, but does that? As soon as I said that, does that make you go? I do that. Just to shut you up. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at this guy. No, but like, like you think about it, no cutting weight. No, you've already got your skills. I already got mine. And, but, in your, but in your, but in exactly, <laughs> you exactly. Stand up comedy. Art. I didn't say about heaps. Um, <laughs> stand up. Your stand up is different to my stand up. But we've both got it. Yo, come in. Hi. What classes? Um, what age group are you teaching classes? Like six to six yeah, six, six up. Yes. Yeah, Fill the plug. Age, age classes here at the MMA clinic. Six age group. to 13 Six and to get 13. your ass in the adults classes. Yeah, exactly. Um, talking about, obviously, we'll put our fight away for now. Um, yeah, but yeah. No, but I, I just wanted to know that because I thought even saying it, you can't, um, you can't like manufacture your first thought in your head. So if me saying that, your first thought was like, I'd fucking do that today. It I'll do it in a minute. <laughs> but it's like, it's interesting no, it's to go. Like, I'm still proud and I still have. Feels funny. Like, my own. So am I. At, at the, the, the jokiest I can and I make fun of myself and all that sort of shit. Like, at the end of the day, I'd still think, like, if you put me in the ring with fucking Steve, there's still a bit of me, Steve Kennedy, there's still a bit of me that goes, I could catch him. Like, you and can't, that's. You can't fight unless you think like that. Do and I mean? that's, but that's, that's why. That's why I want to fight. Is because there's people out there that go, no, I couldn't. 100% I couldn't. And there's a bit of me that goes, I think I could. And I kind of want to not bring that out just yet, but I kind of want to find, a, is, is that real or is that is that misleading? And that's, look, that's why I'm in MMA. That's why a stand-up comedian that's in 
fucking mainstream radio wants to be around MMA. There's something in it. There's something. I think there's a select few of people that have this weird. But thing do you want to be head. known as a tough guy? No. You this don't. is this is the thing. You want to break the stereotype. I I I look at this sport as as not a performance, but like a sport. It's I don't. A sport, yeah. I don't think if you offered me a fight outside on the street, I wouldn't fucking take it. It doesn't matter if you were the worst guy in the world or you had the, the least skill. To me, I'm like, well, I, I've got everything to lose. What if I hit my head, I die? What if you hit your head, you die? Like, I'm always... Think, thinking, yeah, if you think like that, then so in the, it's not a natural fight and instinct. Exactly, but in the sport, I think, within these rules... And it's like when you get in a fight at school. You're going to fucking take the biggest swing. You don't care who it was because you know a teacher's going to jump in there and Someone's stop it. Someone's going to stop you. Yeah. And that's the thing. So, yeah, there is the fear of, I don't think I'm the toughest guy in the world, but I do think that there's that in me that wants to fight in the sport. Yeah. Where there's fighters and then there's yeah, guys that do MMA. And that's, you see, sometimes they do both. Sometimes yeah. there's those guys that will just fucking throw down at the weigh-ins and they don't give a fuck. They'll throw down outside. But they also do MMA and, and vice versa. There's guys that are quite scared. I mean, if you're a UFC fan, guys like GSP are more like the, the sport guys and they, they want to be good at the sport. Then you've got your, your Diaz brothers, which... See oh, yeah. more like yeah, they just, just about that fight. Yeah, they they just want to throw down uh, whenever. But no, I just always want to understand people's psychology when it comes to the sport and, and when it comes to, to thinking about it because you think you know someone, you know, you look at someone, you, you look at even even me, and it looks like yeah, Mitch is just having a great time and he's just kind of having fun. But it's like no, there's some there's some deep dark shit in there too that. I want to test one day or I want to test right now or I want to, like things like that. So it's interesting to find like your philosophy on it and, and um, anyone, anyone that's in a corner, anyone that's watching an MMA event, you'll find people that are like, no, nah, I don't like violence. See, I love I fighting. Fucking love like, it. I love it too. I genuinely, I've got all kinds of people <laughs> like, back in the day, I used to fight all the time in and the gym and out of the gym and I just love fighting on a night out and fight. Uh, you know, I, think, I don't know if it's the army in me or whatever. We kind of grew up that way. I joined the army at 16 and all that drinking and lad culture and, and fighting. And I've just always enjoyed it. You know, I've not always been that successful. You know, I'm a little guy, you know, out there in the mean streets. And, you know, I've had my head bounced off the concrete as many times. You look like I'm, every guy that would start on anyone. <laughs> uh, just, uh, you're looking at me. As many times as, as you know, I've won a, a fight out there, I've lost one. But that's, I think. But I still enjoy it. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Maybe that's the difference too because like I got in a lot of fights but it was because I just wanted to be me and I was just kind of maybe loud but just talking, having a great time and I got picked on a lot. I deserved it, half of it because I'm, I'm consciously talking shit. Like just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was yeah. quite, not trying to get in a fight but I was like, why do you get to tell me to shut up? Like that was my thought process. Like why do you get to tell me to be quiet? I'm... I'm being me, then they start, then I'm like, oh, fuck, I've got to fight. And then, so I went into all this MMA and, and all that sort of shit to sort of just know something because I'm like, I'm not going to stop talking shit. Yeah. I'm just not. It's not in my DNA. I'm going to keep talking shit. And now that there's a little bit of background behind me, I can talk more shit. <laughs> like, and I feel a bit more confident. That's what I fucking enjoy. And I love being around MMA because I can't talk shit in a way. Like, I can't go into... Um, the eternal in the ring announcing, I'd be like, I'm the greatest MC, what are you going to do about it? Nothing! Because, like, the majority will beat the fuck out of me. But when I take it to, like, the basketball world, and someone's like, we're going to fucking beat your ass after the game, and you're just like, no, you're not, you're not going to do shit. And it's like, it helps you with that everyday life stuff, but that's not why I, I did it. Uh, funny, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> it's, so it, you do it with a confidence, to, have, to back up. A bit of both, yeah. Like not. Uh, you said the thing about being a, a tough guy. It's not the. T it's like what gets me through training. Sometimes, like you've talked about, you know, maybe it's it's a kid or it's like you, you know you're fighting to feed them or whatever it is. My whole thing is like I've been in so many fights I can't get out of, and I want to, and I've got no choice. And I've got to do something. So half the time, what gets me through this like training is like one of these days a fight's going to happen when you're not ready that's the other thing you know when you don't feel like going to training that's what gets me to training is going when someone starts on you you don't want that fight but you got to do it so it's the same with training I don't want to fucking go right now but training's on at 10am I'm going to fucking be there at 10am 
it's the same sort of uh, mentality with it all. But I don't know. I think everyone has different. Everyone has a different reason for why they choose to do it. And do you reckon it's upbringing, or do you reckon it's like it's in your blood? I or? think some people's upbringing makes them into fighters, but you know, I didn't have a bad upbringing. That's the thing. You, and, you, you and your brother was it just like you just. My brother definitely got into it for the sport side of things. He, you do, you two, the stories out here, it sounds like you are the, the polar opposites in the way of like... We're, we're very different, but we always end up, like, we always end up at the same place, but we go two completely different routes to get there, but at the core, we're the same, but we take different paths to achieve the same. And that's what intrigues me about the sport, is like we've just been talking about, there's some guys that want to be the best at the sport, and then there's some guys that want to be the toughest fucking fighter, and they end up meeting at the same point yeah but they're fighting for different things and you get the guy that's fighting to be the best athlete can still want it just as bad as the guy that's the toughest and kind of yeah. fighting for his life and that sort of shit but it's just interesting to see people's backgrounds and if you've never seen an MMA fight I've no idea why you're listening to this but if you've, <laughs> if you've ever seen an MMA fight like that's that's what I love about it because everyone from so many different aspects come together and like you've got a few guys that just go oh, I just want, like like Pablo it was like he, he was like a grappler and he goes I, I can't see myself being a black belt not testing it in a real fight yeah and I, I found that an interesting um, sort of reason as, as well because there's the martial arts welcomes all sorts and that's the beauty of it there's and and I've always said in this gym you know there's no race there's no there's no color there's no sex there's no, it's just the sport and everyone is equal. When you get in there, we're all equal. And there's no um, religion, there's no none of that. It's just a place where you can come, be you're all equal and you're all here for the same reason. And that's the beauty of beauty of it for me. Is that people want to bag MMA and stuff like that, but you walk into a place that's you can walk into any gym, you'll be welcomed. Any any gym. And you'll be invited and you'll be and you find martial artists often want to help. So if you're really shit, the person that you're with is, is not just going to beat you up. It is really or, weird how they're going to explain to you how they beat you up and then try and help you as you as you go through. And um, that comes down to like that ego. And, and it's always nice to to be able to assist someone and, and it makes you feel better about how good you are when someone comes in who knows less than you and, and you can pass on a bit of your knowledge. I always find that very uh, difficult when there is someone that's like uh, of lesser knowledge in you and you and you tap them out and you you want to explain how that happened but you don't want to be condescending at the same time you sort of want to be like oh. well, and then you get the guys that that all they want to do is talk while they're sparring while yeah. they're here. and I'm like sometimes I just go shut up and just spar because you're not going to learn anything by spending five minutes talking about this one thing you just did we'll do it Make all the mistakes, after, yeah, yeah, and then afterwards we can address any, any of the problems but do your sparring mm-hmm. and then Post-mortem comes after. It's supposed to be a post-mortem. Yeah. Not a jury mortem. <laughs> why is it not a jury? But that's that's why I, I keep going back to basketball and the correlation because of basketball is almost like the mainstream thinking. Like people play sport, people play games and everyone always kind of shuns MMA and they think it's all just tough and mean. But if you're shit at basketball and you walk into a, a training and you're not at that level... They tell you to fuck off. Where and any other sport, it's very similar. Where MMA, they're a lot more welcoming, and you remember, okay, we all started there. We all started there, and I don't know if it was like that with rugby, but everyone was similar in that. In, in whatever it is with the sport, you're almost meaner. And they're like, when it's one on one, if you've got a guy that's shit, you'll you'll score sixteen nothing and be proud of it, type thing. But for some reason in MMA, you're not getting anything out of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that. I'm, you know, if you're smashing someone in basketball, you might be, oh, I'm going to perfect my fucking two jump shot, right? So, boom. <laughs> you score all, all your points by a jump shot. But in, in fighting, if you can... Pablo describes it really well. He had an interclub fight against a white belt. And, you know, it was a fight. It's an exhibition fight, but it was still a fight. He could have just took the guy down and yeah. submitted him, but he said, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to learn anything from it, so I'm just going to stand up for you. And that's kind of the attitude that's going to get you places. And I think that's that's why the martial arts are so interested in that. 
you get um, someone that doesn't know what they're doing. You can have your way with them the way you want, but you don't learn anything from them. I, I find my biggest problem when I'm, when I am uh, training with someone is that there's always, if you're watching two guys train, very rarely are you saying a point to two people. You generally, it's always like someone's done something and you're explaining it to them and the other person, but it's because of that one person. Yeah. I always find it quite uh, like an awkward situation when I feel we, we're spending too much time on me. Like if, if we're going like, Mitch, uh, this is going to be great for you or this, and we and you can kind of feel that the session's all about you or the training session's all about you. And I like it when it's much more like, how can I help the guy I'm training with rather than how can it help me? And I don't know I if that... I generally coach the person that's losing. <laughs> that's probably why I'm always getting coached. <laughs> that makes so much more sense yeah. now. But that's, even like the, the toughest guys, you can tell they're working on something. Like uh, last week, we had a brown belt, Luke, I forgot his last name, but he's a little brown belt. We're working on like the vaporizer, the uh, the truck position and all that sort of stuff. Fucking no idea what I was doing. But like picked it up and was like, could do some form of defense over and over again. And we just did that. And I felt way more useful than if he was just throwing up arm bars and I had to get out. Like there's something about it. And I... I that worries me about taking up an MMA career because maybe I'm not selfish enough in like my knowledge. Maybe I just kind of want to help. And maybe that's, you know, there's guys that are just training partners, just great training partners, but they don't, they're not the guy that, that wins yeah. all the fights. And I think, I wonder if maybe I'm just, yeah. maybe I'm just going to be the training partner guy. And I often think that, especially when I see guys, see certain fighters and I go, you know, is he the training partner or is he the guy? Because it's like you're, Conor McGregor, and then you Artem Lobov, who obviously his career is no slouch, but Artem Lobov is the training partner of Conor McGregor. That, that's kind of his thing, and that's great, but ultimately Conor McGregor is the one that gets all the praise out of it. So I always wonder, and obviously you don't have to mention it, but is there any guys that you see like that might be just a training partner guy, or they all look like they're... No, no, no one jumps out at me. Uh, maybe one. I'm not going to mention anyone. No, I've got there might be one or two that are you know, amazing in the gym, but might not quite cut it when we get them out there. But um, they're happy just to plod, all, plod away and, and give their input in the gym and be a handful for for the guys in the gym. So. And I mean, they're so vital. They're, if anything, the most vital part because you need those training partners. And if you've just got guys that are just in it for themselves. If they don't have a fight coming up, maybe they don't put in as much. So therefore, yeah, well, they're not here. the guy, yeah, it's and the guy good. that the guy they're with doesn't get a hundred percent because he doesn't give a fuck. So it's like you either have to have them training on the on fighting on the same card, yeah, or it's useless. But yeah, I don't really want people in my team that aren't going to put back in. Can you? That's what I was going to say. Can you see through that? Like, oh, hundred percent, because they have their fight and then they fucking disappear and then they're. They start wanting another fight and their little face starts appearing back up in the gym again. But I don't really have anyone like that. But Have you ever or is it um, they get sifted out? No, not really. It doesn't fit in. We're quite a, a close-knit team. Um, like even, like, it blew me away last week, week after the fight. Josh was back in, Issam was back in. Um, Adam was the only one who wasn't back in and, and he yeah. might have been back in on, on a couple of nights on it, but he had a fucking... When you get fired on the night, you've got, you got to rest <laughs> of fucking bits and pieces. Everyone else was back in. You know, Harv was back in. Uh, Pablo was back in. Ricky was, was rightly taking a bit of time off as well. So, um, yeah, to see them all back in, knowing that Mitch and uh, Jack have fights coming up. You know, Ryan's in there going hard. Um, even though he's not been training, you know, he's digging out for Mitch because they're the best training partners for each other. Um, so Ryan's just, he has really been focusing on coaching and he's just jumped straight back into the deep end with Mitch. I feel like certain guys almost take like pride in, in, in being the training partner of a certain I don't guy. I think it's taking pride in being a certain training partner, but you, you know, you might have someone the same size as you that you get paired up with a lot that you want to help and, and you want to be there for them because they were there for you and, and, and vice versa. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting because like, uh, especially about kick ass, like when Marcus is training for his fight, you've got certain guys that they're always going hard but there's that that next level because it's like Marcus is one of the main guys at kick so when he's got his fight coming up it's just it's different level like Cam Murky who's fucking scary just in life 
But like when he's training and he's putting that bit extra because he really cares for Marcus as well. So it's like he's giving 120%. Yeah, exactly. And that's what makes teams successful. You know, you look at the fighters that come out of gyms. Like, at any good gym, everyone's like that. Mm-hmm. That did you have that when you like that like that's a, oh hundred percent. What's the difference between now and, and back then, or did you always have that that main core? No, it was, it was you know well for for me in this gym because I have built it upon how we used to train, so it's pretty much the same. We maybe train a little bit smarter, you know. Now there's not that old school bravado. You know, I don't don't believe that you need to kick lumps out of each other fucking twenty four seven. Sometimes we. You step back on the intensity, uh, on the power a little bit and stuff like that. Well, the main thing that I took from you was like the first ever time I came in was, and then you guys were all sparring, and everyone was fucking throwing down. I think it was Jack and Josh, of course. And you had to go, guys, like that's fucking cool, but you're not going to throw like that in a fight because we're going to be smarter than that. And it was a real, like, that was a real eye opener straight, straight away. I was like, because to anyone normal, that looks like sparring. Like that looks like, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. But the way you sort of explained it where it was like, you're not going to fight like that, so don't just do that because you know you can... How you train is how you fight. Yeah. As I say to the guys all the time, is sometimes you know they'll, they don't finish a move 100%, so they might do a takedown but not consolidate the position afterwards. Whereas if you do that in a fight and there's that little gap between finishing the takedown and consolidating the position, someone's going to get up. Mm. You know, they're not just going to wait there and pin them on the floor. And, and stuff like that, or, you know, you, I don't know, there's millions of examples, but train how you want to fight, mm-hmm. so, if, um, oh, shit, you know what happened next? <laughs> but um, that was uh, what I was doing the last couple couple of um, days of training, is I would always, I'd finish a move, like, Steve would be like, right, one, two, hold, and you shoot, and you just kind of, you do it type thing, and then I've got this other guy who's just got this, like, grit is like crazy where he always wants to take my fucking head off he likes me i think but he's always trying to take my fucking head off and there's something about where i'll take him down and the move's over but he'll kind of he'll sweep and then i used to just kind of be okay with that like yeah i'm taking the knowledge out of it like cool i, I finished the takedown doesn't matter to now it gets to the point where i take him down he sweeps i sweep again and it's kind of like we're but starting what you should to be doing down. is taking him down and not letting him sweep. yeah so that, that for me would be the thing to learn from that is all right if he's sweeping me that easy I need to finish the takedown and control that position. It's exactly what we're yeah, talking about. Yeah, similar, so. similar facts with that, like where it's become, it makes me sharper in the sense of going like, okay, well, yeah, it might be not uh, like not what he's supposed to do in a way, but it kind of is getting the best out of me because sometimes I'm a bit lazy because I'm not training for a fucking fight. Yeah. And you kind of, I don't know if that's, if some guys are like that, any fighters out there that are like that, but if you don't have a fight coming up, maybe you do take your foot off the gas. I don't a think bit. fighters, when they're because from, and this is what I try. And another thing, oh, I'm fucking going on a bit, but no, that's what another thing hear. I try and instill in people is, I never wanted to give up a single takedown, so I'd fight every takedown if it was a drill or a, or a spa. Like I wouldn't just accept it. I I don't want to lose ever mm. in training, and, and and I think all good fighters that have the same mentality. They don't want to be seen to be taken down. They don't want to be seen to be um, getting dominated in the stand-up. That's not what, what they want. And I wanted to win every minute of every round of every spar I ever had. Like, that is how my mind frame was at the time. And that, So I don't think that fighters, good fighters, will have the bit where they go, oh, yeah, he can take me down. My pride was like, I never want to get taken down by anyone, even if he's fucking 20 foot fucking taller than me which is not difficult. <laughs> you know, even if it was a heavyweight, I'm like, I don't want you to take me down. I'm fucking better than that. And, and you know, sometimes you're going to get taken down, but as long as you've fought it tooth and nail, you're learning from it. Whereas if you just go, oh yeah, fuck, he's got the takedown, I'll just go with this one because I'm tired or whatever. That's how you're going to fucking be in a fight when yeah. you're tired. You know? I think there is, uh, I think that's a, a great way to think of, what helps me, just me personally, and obviously it comes down to every other fighter is, is different. That's what I like about Steve is the fact that he recognizes that I'm fucking retarded. No, that like he's still, like each guy's are different, and you might have to do it this way, or you might have to learn this way. And he rolls with it pretty well. Like he can teach you specifically. Yeah, hundred percent. And my thing is like I might need you to let me take you down so I can get 
the movement right and get everything and get the feel. Oh, right. and then there's a difference between sparring it or drilling it live mm. and practicing it. But there are guys that you feel like want to Some win. guys are absolutely... I remember I was in fucking Extreme Couture in Vegas training and Forrest Griffin was teaching the class, right? He was the world champion at the time. He was teaching the class because they had a big fight night and he was the only instructor not dealing with the fight night. And the guy that he picked to demonstrate with him wanted to fucking fight him the whole yeah. time. So he's demonstrating and then this guy's going 100%. So Forrest is having to have this fucking little scrambling match and it's taking a move instead of taking 30 seconds for him to demonstrate or a minute mm. it's taking like three minutes because he's just putting this fucking idiot in, in his place um, so yeah you get those guys that are fucking nightmare this is one in every gym mm. just a fucking nightmare uh, mate we're drilling have you ever had to say to someone this is a drill it's not sparring let me fucking do it but that's the thing so so young in my uh, martial arts career is that I'm going we're drilling and then in my head I go Wait, is that right? Am I doing the right thing, or should it always be going one hundred percent? Like this. No, so for me, you should it should be outlined at the beginning. This is a drill. We're practicing this move, so be compliant. Mm. Um, obviously, don't if it's a takedown, don't just fall over. <laughs> they need to know that, but you're not resisting. Yeah. But if it doesn't knock you over, then don't fall over. But but don't sprawl and fucking. You know, and I always and switches and I always find the issue too. Like I've got kind of like, oh, we're doing the drill. Oh, that's the takedown. And I'm like, oh no, you got me down. Like, and then it's like, no, nah, you're not fucking getting me down. I'm going 100. percent Like, I find it really hard to go medium. Like, and that's that shouldn't be for me. Like, the, the line should be clear. If it's live spot, live drilling, then you go 100 yeah. percent to stop it. If it's drilling, not live drilling, just drilling, mm-hmm. so where you're learning the move and practicing the move, probably at the beginning. So a good class would be you learn the move in. With no resistance, just going, taking your time, getting getting all the steps right, and then the second half of the class might be right live drill. Mm. So now we're starting in this position. You've got that, but you've got to finish it. Um, but your partner's going to go one hundred percent. That there should be a clear line, but there's still fucking always an idiot. There's so. always a, it's, it's a, but sometimes it even comes from a good fighter. Like the, even that, even that line, or no, no, not necessarily a good fighter, but a guy that competitive nature. Has oh, you're not fucking good enough. And that's that's the thing, and I and you, as a coach, you've got to weed that out. Yeah, that's just, like, your guys are never you're never going to learn the tr- technique properly. You need to do it a thousand million times before you, it becomes like that. So you need to get those reps in. I just think you can't win. Sometimes you can't win training. Like you, you're there to get better, not not win training. Like it's about like I think a lot of jujitsu guys talk about it about guys that try not to get sub the whole class. And yeah, you didn't get sub. I had a conversation with a guy today after Jitsu about that. He held me in half guard. Oh, it's my job to pass this half guard. But he had no intention. It's one thing passing someone's half guard. Yeah. He had no intention of moving from half guard. Like, so he just shut down. Yeah. You know, and he'd been grappling for a while, so it's not like... He just didn't want to do anything else, but he didn't want his half guard to get passed. And that always and, feels And weird. I said to him afterwards, if you play that game, you're never going to get any better. Like... Maybe play your half guard, but take a few more risks because it's training. So try try harder for your sweeps. That's that analogy in life, I guess. It's like you, you can play it safe and nothing nothing hurts you, and but you don't get that that big payoff. And it's yeah, you're never gonna you know you're never gonna improve dramatically unless you take some risks. Yeah, I always, I always find that find that interesting, and, and it is natural. Like whenever you get caught, the, the first thing that probably pops into your head is. No, oh, but if I was, if, oh no, if I was serious, or, or, and like everyone does it, but it's how you kind of go. No, 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 I'm being, I'm being, I'm being stupid. A lot of people have noticed have thought that, like a mentality is your first, like oh, I'm, I'm always thinking like this. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have that, that uh, excuse of like, um, oh, I'm not going to go hard, or, or I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go cruisy. And then your second thought is, no, 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 go hard. Or no, 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 slow it down. Your mentality is kind of what you make your body do as well as what you think, not just your initial thought. Because when I get caught in a sub, my first thought is like, oh, no, 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 but if I was serious, you wouldn't have caught me. But then I go, no, Mitch, don't be a fucking idiot. Like, What you should be thinking is, why did I get caught? Yeah, that's the that's It's the, not the, the act of tapping thing. that's the problem. It's the fact that you got put in the position that made you tap in the first place. So whether you, like, and I'm a massive culprit of it, of, fighting really hard to get out of submissions and sometimes I get out mm. 
But what I need to learn is not to escape them, but not to get in them in the first place. Your first mistake comes from getting put in the position yeah. that makes you tap, not the actual tap itself. Like you, you'll have a lot of guys in class that will be in a fucking straight arm bar and they they won't be they won't tap. Yeah, they won't, as if they're being tough. And I did it all as a white belt. Like for like fucking years, I was like, no, no, tap on someone has got into that position and got your arm, you've already lost. That's it, and that's the and thing. You do obviously need to practice escaping yeah. and stuff like that, but if you've got to have that attitude of like, why did I end up in that position? Mm. What mistake did I make to be put there? Not all my defense wasn't good enough. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago, with Marcus, about about belts, and I find that that's that's when you know you're at your next level is when you start going, I can tap. Because I lost by being in the position, not the actual. Pablo is another. I use him as an example. He's zero ego, so he'll be wrong with a white belt, and he lets him play with him a little bit, and he'll get submitted here and there because he's letting people move around. But he doesn't care. Mm. I still have like a little bit of ego about tapping. Like, you're not. I don't get submitted very often, and I fucking hate it. But yeah. I'm coming to terms with it, and it happens. And the better your guys get, it's almost a, a compliment that they're getting good enough to. Uh, yeah. Because when they started, they couldn't. That's what I think. This is what I'm trying to weed out of myself is if I go against a purple belt or like a good blue belt or like anyone higher, I almost, if I get caught, Doesn't I'm just matter. like, I'm just like, oh, damn. Like, and, and then if it's someone like lower, I get really like defensive about it. I'm like, I'm not going to fucking tap. Belt. And I, that's not a good thing because. When I'm rolling with the high belt, instead of going, nah, fuck, I can tap him out. Like, I shouldn't tap to this and, and really try to get competitive. I almost get, like, there's already a built-in excuse. Matter if I lose, yeah, yeah and, and that's, and and that's the breaking. worst thing in the world, I, I, I think, is that you can just go, it's not oh. not the worst thing in the world. I mean, it's okay to give yourself, you know, jiu-jitsu is one of them, you're going to have people better than you and you learn a lot in that respect, but you also need, need the people below you that you can practice all your shit on and then, your defense is getting good with the better people and your attack's getting good with the worst people. I always wondered if maybe, say say the purple belt catches me, my job is to go, fuck, I shouldn't have got caught in that. My coach's job, your job is for you to tell me, no, nah, Mitch, it's okay. Like it's, I, yeah. I feel like it's not my job to go to make the excuse. It's kind of like my coach's to go, hey, Mitch, think about this. Like, Yeah, the, if, you know, if you see it unfold as a coach, you say, right, the reason that happened was left your arms a little bit isolated from your body, you need to bring your arms a little bit tighter, um, get onto your side a little bit more, you're a bit flat, or whatever it, mm. it may be. Not, um, oh yeah, don't worry about it, he's a purple belt. You're <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's just, I think the ego gets talked about a lot, but to be the best, you know, grappler you can be, that ego needs, needs to go, mm. because that will prevent you from doing things you might have done if you didn't care so much about getting caught. So, um, and in order to improve your game, you've got to try and put new stuff into it. Whereas if you go with someone better and you just go back to your safe haven, yeah, oh, this is what I do, then you're never gonna again, you're never gonna improve. You might as well just hold half belt. I think there is a good so you do have to have that good mix as well because uh, I don't know about anyone else, but. When I first started, I kept a t uh, tally. I was about 17, 18 when I first started Jiu Jitsu, and I had a little tally at home. And I got tapped 182 times before I got my first one. And to me, I was so proud of getting that first one that the 182 I like, took all these lessons from it. But I can see how that dominance can, can but crush the confidence. No, I don't see it that way. See, Jiu Jitsu is a circle of life. So you start off at the bottom, you're a white belt. You're gonna get. You're gonna learn how to defend first in mm. jiu-jitsu. That's the thing. And then sooner or later you'll find oh, I'm going through rounds and not getting submitted anymore. You know, I might have gone with a guy who tapped me 182 times in one round. <laughs> like I went with a few guys like that when I first started grappling. But before you know it, you're giving them. They're having to work so hard to mm. submit you. And then one round, you might even get on top for three seconds before the bottom, and and it just builds itself like that. And then whole new bloke joins. You're like. Fucking hell. I'm all over this fucker. And he's getting tapped 182 times and you're yeah. only getting tapped 90 times now and you're tapping him. And it's that. That's rotation. what used to, when I was in just, just jiu-jitsu for a while, that was my whole thing. I, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm getting any better. I just got to wait till new guys show up. And then, like, and you just get better by default. 
And but you're, all get, you're all getting better together. Yeah. So, so you're getting better, but the people you're training with are getting better. So you don't see the level change, then. especially the higher up the belt you go. You know, making strides is a lot harder. When you're a white belt, your level goes up like this. Yeah. And then you get to blue and it eases off a little bit. And then you get to purple and it eases off a little bit more. And then brown and I don't know what it's like when you get to black, but I'm assuming that you know every inch you gain is a fucking year in the making. You know. Yeah. Because you've got so much knowledge at that time. And that's, uh, it's the age old, like, with grappling, you, you pretty much go 100%. So when you lose, you fucking lost. Cause you, mm-hmm. Where with striking, there are times where you get a lot of people who are like, oh, we'll just go on 70%. No, like, if we were going 100, I was trying to knock you out. Yeah, but the minute you're thinking like that, it's time to readjust your attitude, I think. And it takes a long time to mature into mm-hmm. that attitude. I was never like that um, in the beginning. Because you were fucking bare knuckle days. <laughs> just <laughs> just going idiotic. Nuts. Yeah, just like fucking getting into it. Um, Eternal 29 mm. coming up. You've got, what, three weeks? Just about, uh, three weeks on Saturday. Sure. So and, uh, South, Southport? Southport Sharks. Um, headlined by the Australian MMA fighter of the year, I believe. Callum Clark, Brennan Munn. And so that is... Uh, obviously, we've got a title fight under... That is just because they're, I mean, they're massive stars, Callum Potter and, and Brendan Muffet. Is that why they're headlining or are they selling it's out? A title or? Is it title? It is title. Callum took your cousin's title. <sighs> bring that up. I had to bring it up. Mm. So, yeah, that's the, that's the title fight. And then Mitch will, Martin, who's one of my fighters, will defend his bantamweight strap for the first time against uh, Tyrell, how do you say it? Ty Hogan. Ty Hogan, yeah. It's very, very difficult. I thought it was Tyrell. Tyrell. Yeah, but we should call him Ty. Okay, we'll call him Ty. Yeah, much better. Uh, the NT Kid, which uh, is from Darwin. So, I'm from Darwin. I like Mitch Martin. I'm interested in this, but... but <laughs> uh, I was just about to say, I'm picking him, and then I was like, mm, I really like Mitch Martin, though, as I looked up at his photo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it petrified me. Um, yeah, so it's, it's those two fights alone. Obviously, uh, the winner of Callum Potter and Brendan Mumford will fight Isaac for the belt. Uh, and um, uh, Mitch Martin, obviously, uh, impressive performance against Mick, Mick Addison. Um, oh, and he's focused. I've never seen him since winning that belt. Why like, he's so focused in training? So a quick one on Mitch, Mitch Martin. Go into his if if you can go into his confidence. He's got this like level of or, this aura where it's like he just it's a quiet confidence. It's not arrogance. Is no way arrogance. He's just his. He backs himself, and he's even the way he the it, talks. It's not arrogant. But it's... He's had some hard fights, you know, he's come through some tricky um, fights. His first pro fight that he took in short notice, a, a upper weight class, and got his orbital bone broken, ended up in hospital, but won a decision on the way to that hospital visit. You know, um, he's just he's just a tough kid, you know. He's, he's very um, level-headed, but he knows his abilities and he knows what he... Um, what he brings to the table, you know, he, he's got a good ground game, he's got a really unorthodox stand-up game, and he's fit. You know, he's gonna, he's gonna fight every second of every round. Mm. So that gives him the confidence, but you never, he's never overconfident. And then, how do we, how do we find his opponent? Like, how did that get matched? Um, he was due to fight a Nitro, and unfortunately, Nitro um, pulled their show. So um, he needed an opponent, and unfortunately, Paul Bone. So just it uh, just matched up, just lined up. So it just so happened to be um, stars aligned, and that's the fight. What's got. Mitch Martin's record at now? Three and zero. Three and zero. Quick story on the records. I was doing a ignition bout on the weekend, and the the card said like, as I get handed all this like cool information, it's so professional, it's so rare. Um, but I get, no, I get handled this information about I the fighters and their fight records and everything like that. And it they had one guy, I think it was Brian, I might be wrong here, but Brian Adams or something fighting out of Singer. Bailey. Yeah, like, I know it was Brian Adams because I would have made that joke ages ago. But fighting out of Bailey, uh, they he fought in the main yeah, event. Thing, uh, do <laughs> That'd be great to walk out to. But his thing said 19, 19 wins. And then the losses column was empty and the jaws was empty. And earlier on the night, I asked Peter Boyd who runs the show. I was like, oh, just no, like nothing there means zero. And he was like, yeah, there's nothing there means zero. So I was like 19 and 0. 
And then so I'm introducing him and I'm like, the undefeated, like 19 and 0. And everyone's like, oh, you're crazy. And then I get there and as soon as I turn around, the whole commission's like, what the fuck? They all look super confused. Like, what are you doing, Mitch? He's like, his record's 15 and 7. Everyone's like, his record's 15 and 7. So I had like my first like blunder in a way. But I was like, but if it's really like, I don't know, it's a 19 no. I was like, that's Muay Thai though. You can just make up your record. But yeah, it's just um, interesting with records because we've, we've talked about that before. The records we're... in this country are fucked. Simple as that. Now there's a thing, people are changing their records, they're going back to shows. Oh no, that was actually a pro fight to bump up their pro wins a little bit. And it's, it's just fucked. But it will even itself, now it's being better looked after, it's going to even itself out mm. um, and, and become better. But yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, I mean the records don't. If we get people thinking, I think MMA does a good job of it, if we get people not worrying about records, yeah, then we're better off for as long as we're not like boxing where we're worried about the O, the 15 and O, 18 and O. Um, and uh, we've got, is your boy Aaron Fisher, is he fighting on this one? My is boy, Aaron Your Fisher. boy, Aaron Fisher. He's, big boy. He's your boy. He's from Puma. Uh, <laughs> I know him very um, rant, uh, vaguely. <laughs> But yeah, Aaron is... To be fair, most people on this card are your boys compared to me. Yeah. So. No, Aaron's fighting um, Brian Lambert. Um, Aaron's going to look to bounce back from that setback he had with uh, Justin. So yeah, that's going to be a good fight. Aaron, like I say, Aaron's style um, brings excitement. It's just the way he fights. The way he got his back taken was throwing a massive head kick at Justin. So. Mm. I don't think Aaron's going to have changed. I hope he hasn't. And... Um, <laughs> He's going to come out there and bring it, and Ryan's a solid competitor, you know, and he's going to look at the way that Justin coped with Aaron and, and you know, try and close the distance and, and shut down some of the space, but Aaron's a beast on the ground too, so good luck. I mean, it's a tough fight for Ryan, it's a tough fight for Aaron, so it's one of those good matches, and, and I expect the fireworks in that one. So it's going to be a good card. It's... Uh, 16 fights so far. We'll, we'll go through it properly. Uh, some of them will fall out, no doubt. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's going to be a solid card. Last eternal card of the year. Um, so, yeah. Just can put most of the Queensland card together. Yeah. And you don't have much to... I don't have too much to do with it. Um, I'd obviously talk about it and throw ideas around and names around when he's looking for matches mainly for the pro card because I don't have the massive knowledge of the amateurs mm. so um, so yeah we'll um, preview that card fully when it's released next week and uh, you guys are not fancy on the posters What's, well what who's doing promotion? it I believe I'm not going to say because I don't know <laughs> I just wonder because they're like actually starting to look good <laughs> <laughs> no I don't know I think it counts can invest a little bit more uh, into that. So that's good. Uh, Engage still part of the Queensland. Engage still side. part of Queensland. Yeah, um, Ash is going to be there. Um, again, I'm going to hold off on a couple of things. <laughs> uh, just waiting on a few. It's very censored for an uncensored podcast. No, I just don't want to like say we're going to do something and then it doesn't happen. So there's a couple of things in the works for that card, which will be eternal firsts. In terms of um, the promotion as opposed to the fighters and stuff. Oh, like an outdoor show. Not an outdoor show, no. Um, right, should we wrap this up? Because I'm dying for it. As you might have noticed, I've started rocking in the chair. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at like the last 10 minutes. I've just been waiting for you yeah. to explode. Um, guys, uh, anything else you want to know? If you, uh, Like we said at the start, if you want to get on the podcast, hit us up. Uh, just eternal on my go through there. Uh, we'll have you on. I don't care who the fuck you are. We'll chuck you on. Um, anything else people need to know? Tickets? Anything like that? If you're in Queensland? www.eternalmay.com Purchase them from there. Yep, good. I'm really glad you, you told everyone out that I wouldn't have managed without you. All right, um, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, see, you. we'll see you next week. And uh, thank you for listening. Love. Eternal MMA Uncensored.